excuse you if you pause. For inviting me to uh, present here today, um, the uh, this is a project. I'm going to be presenting a project uh, where I, we attempted to identify migratory uh, priority areas for migratory birds in the Canadian prairie potholes. Um, the PHJV Science Committee has been heavily involved in this project from the beginning, and I think I even uh, a couple years ago gave a presentation, a proposal of this project to a joint meeting between the policy and the science committee. Uh, here in Edmonton, so it's really great to be here today to uh, present some results to you folks uh, now that we've finished the first phase of this project. Uh, so before I get into the details, I just want to give you a little bit of background information to make sure everyone get, has the right context information. Um, first of all, this figure here is actually showing uh, the Canadian portion of what we call Bird Conservation Region 11, the Prairie Pothole Region. Uh, it's a very similar boundary to the PHJV uh, boundary. The, the PHJV boundary extends a little bit further north up into the boreal, and there's that chunk that's uh, to the northwest. Um, but it's a very similar border. It encompasses the, the open grassland ecosystems as well as the aspen parkland ecosystems uh, in Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba. Um, the different colors there represent the habitat types that are present across the landscape. Uh, the two that I'd like to focus on are first the cultivated land, which is the beige color that makes up the majority of the area, and then the grassland or rangeland habitats, uh, which is shown in brown. So prior to European colonization, it's, it's probably safe to assume that the vast majority of that um, cultivated land was grassland. So actually throughout this region, probably 75% roughly of the grassland habitat has been altered and changed into row crop agriculture. So we're dealing with a heavily modified landscape, um, and as a result, if you look at um, the populations of birds that rely on grassland habitats, uh, they've been doing quite poorly over the last uh, few decades. This graph here is from the 2019 State of the Birds in Canada report that came out earlier this year, and it's, what it shows is, is population change in, of different bird groups over the last 50 years, um, and as you can see, grassland birds uh, are among the are one of the bird groups that have experienced some of the steepest declines uh, at 57% loss over the last 50 years. And I think that can be largely attributed to this, this massive habitat conversion that's happened throughout the region uh, since European colonization. Now alternatively, if you look at another prominent bird group on the prairies, waterfowl, you can see that um, they've, their population are doing really well. They've increased by about 150% over the same time period. And I think one of the reasons that, uh, for this, this trend that we see is that um, for some time now, we've uh, understood where the high priority habitats are for waterfowl. And um, uh, that they are shown here in these hashed uh, polygons. And those are what are called the PHDB target landscapes. They're developed in conjunction with Ducks Unlimited uh, based on duck density models. And so those are the areas within the prairies that produce the most ducks, essentially, where the, where the highest density of breeding pairs of ducks occur. And uh, because we've had a, an understanding of these priority areas, um, uh, the PHJV and all their partners have been able to implement really targeted conservation programs for, for wetland habitat that, that have obviously benefited waterfowl. Um, however, you know, um, if we wanted to implement a similar strategy for, say, grassland birds to try and get their populations up or, or slow the decline of those populations, um, the first thing we'd have to do is actually define and, and identify those priority habitats, um, which hasn't been done, at least not empirically, uh, to the extent that it's been done for waterfowl. Um, in addition to this, um, like all the other joint ventures, the PHJV is in is sort of in the process of trying to expand to a more all bird focus. Traditionally, the JVs have been focused on wetlands and, and ducks, waterfowl, obviously. Um, but the American JVs have, are a bit further ahead of us on, on this, but um, they want to try and have a more all bird scope within their planning. And so one of the first questions, the easiest questions to ask is, is are there other bird groups, non-game bird groups that are potentially benefiting from uh, conservation activities that are occurring in these uh, waterfowl priority areas? Um, in order to answer that question, we have to first identify priority areas for other bird groups. So that's kind of where this, uh, what stimulated this project. And here in Canadian Wildlife Service, uh, in conjunction with, with folks at the PHJV Science Committee, we decided that it's, it's uh, time to conduct a truly all-bird priority areas analysis uh, for the region. So the objectives of this project were first and foremost to expand the priority areas analysis to two different bird groups. Uh, we've already have it done for waterfowl. 
We wanted to expand it to marsh birds, which are essentially non-game birds associated with wetland habitats, so things like um, grebes and coots and sora and rail. And then to um, land birds, which are non-game birds associated with upland habitats. And these, this is primarily a songbird group, and this is where all those declining grassland birds that I showed you at the first figure are a part of this land bird group. So things like Baird, Sparrow, Chestnut, and McCown's Longspur, Sprague's Pippet. Those are the birds that are, are having the hardest time and, and uh, that really rely on, on native grassland habitats. So that was the first objective. Um, the second objective was to determine whether how much overlap there was across uh, in priority areas across the different bird groups. So if there's a lot of Hello? overlap... Hello? So if there's a lot of overlap um, uh, across the um, that would indicate that there is potential for, for non-game species to potentially benefit from uh, waterfowl conservation activities occurring in these target land, these PHJV target landscapes. Or if there's no overlap, then, then we might start thinking that uh, other bird groups require their own separate conservation strategies. They can't really ride on the coattails of, of uh, the waterfowl conservation effort. Uh, we also wanted to produce a product from this analysis that uh, helped uh, act as a decision support tool to support uh, some of Environment and Climate Change Canada's funding programs that we implement, like EcoGift's SARPAL Nature Fund. These are programs that where money goes out to landowners to promote conservation of habitat for species at risk. And by understanding where the high priority habitats are for migratory birds, we can really sort of streamline how we allocate this money. Um, if, we, if we're interested in protecting migratory birds in particular. But we also wanted to make sure that any product we produced was useful for our conservation partners uh, in NGOs like Nature Conservancy of Canada, Ducks Unlimited, and, and Manitoba Habitat Heritage Corporation, so that they could use the product as a, as a decision support tool to help them uh, make decisions about uh, land securements and acquisitions. So we really wanted to, to produce a product um, that was beneficial not just internally for us at Environment Climate Change Canada, but to all of our conservation partners that are, you know, have the same goal of conserving habitat across the prairie potholes. So the first step in, in this project was to figure out how we're going to define priority from a migratory bird's perspective. Um, and the best we could do, I think it's a fairly good assumption, is assume that priority is related to abundance. So, you know, if a particular hypothetical species is, is really abundant in a certain area, then we can assume that that, that area is important for populations of that species. <clears throat> and this is a pretty common um, way to conduct priority areas analyses. And so that means in order to move forward then, we required spatially explicit models of abundance for as many species within these three bird groups as possible. And that's how we, the first couple of years of this project was spent acquiring models from, from various people and also building models in-house as well. Um, and uh, so what we, we were able to acquire models for seven species of waterfowl from uh, Jim DeVries and colleagues at Ducks Unlimited Canada. This map here is just showing an example of a, a blue winged teal density uh, model. So anything in red is higher, higher predicted to be higher abundance of uh, breeding pairs of blue winged teal. And green is lower abundance. Uh, we got mar uh, models for 10 species of marsh birds from uh, Kyle Drake and colleagues at Bird Studies Canada. And this is just showing an example of a model for a horned grebe. And then um, internally, myself and others in the Canadian Wildlife Service produced um, models for 12 land bird species. And this is just showing an example of a Baird Sparrow model here. I don't want to go into the details of any of these models. Uh, it's kind of beyond the scope of this, this presentation today. Um, but if people have questions later on at the end or, or want to contact me by email later, I'd be happy to talk in more detail about the models. So once we had these models, um, oh, oh, sorry. Uh, so these tables just show um, the actual species that, that were included. I don't want to go through these lists in any detail. Um, just wanted to throw it up there in case people are interested. But the, the one thing I do want to point out is the second column there, the priority column. And what that represents is the conservation priority of the species. Um, so we had four categories, either uh, species at risk, which are those species defined under the Species at Risk Act. And then we also had a high priority, medium, or sorry, moderate and low. And those high, moderate, and low are based on partners in flight, regional conservation concern scores that were provided. So we were able to pull those from existing literature. Um, and just another thing I want to point out is if you look at the land birds, it's heavily skewed toward you know, more high priority species than the rest of the bird groups. There's five species at risk, two high priority species. 
Whereas in marsh birds, the only high priority species is the horned grebe, and for waterfowl, the only high priority species was the, the northern pintail. Um, and that's really, you know, stems from the fact, like that first graph I showed you, the land birds, the grassland birds are the ones doing the poorest um, in terms of population declines, and so that's why they, they have a higher conservation concern. So that'll come up later, so I just wanted to point that out. So once we had all these species distribution models, the next thing was to conduct, actually conduct a priority areas analysis. And we did this with a software program called Zonation. So in this software, uh, the inputs are the species models I just talked about. And the output from it is, you, is a relative priority. So this map on the right is just showing an example of what the output looks like. Um, this is the same, same uh, BCR11 prairie pothole region. Um, anything in red is a high priority, anything in blue is a lower priority. And I don't want to get into too much detail about how this software works because it's kind of complicated, but sort of in a nutshell, um, what it does is it assigns a priority rank to each cell across the study area. And this is based on cell removal order. So what it does is the software looks at every pixel across the entire study area and it evaluates the abundance of all the species that you input into the software. And whatever pixels have the lowest relative abundance across all species get removed in the first iteration. And then it, it reanalyzes the remaining pixels and it does the same thing and it keeps doing that over and over again. It keeps removing pixels, the lowest quality pixels, uh, until all the pixels are gone. And then, so, you know, and the, the priority rank is based on removal order. So the pixels are moved first to the lowest priority, the ones removed last to the highest priority. So in a nutshell, that's how the software works. Uh, when I say cells, I'm talking about the cell size I use is 800 meters by 800 meters, so that's roughly the size of a quarter section. So it gives you an idea of the scale of the analysis. So we, and the reason we chose that is we really, we know that on the ground management really happens at the quarter section. Land securements and purchases happen at the quarter section. Um, Grassland conversions happens at the quarter section scale, so we wanted to make sure we, we did a meaningful scale of analysis for this. Okay, so I mentioned at the beginning that uh, we defined priority based on bird abundance, uh, but we also identified six additional factors that, that could be used to tweak our definition of, of priority. And so those, these, um, uh, these here on the left, this column on the left represents the factors that I'm talking about. And then over here, this is the, the two different values that each factor can have. So for example, the, uh, the zonation software allows you to use two separate prioritization algorithms, one that focuses, that defines priority based on species representation, and another one that, uh, that focuses on species diversity. I don't want to get into the details of how that works. It's complicated, but there's two different choices you can, you can use. The second factor there, protected areas. So this is an important one. Um, so, so the zonation software allows you to include existing protected areas or exclude them. And I'll just you give it a, a hypothetical example to explain how this works. So imagine if you included uh, protected areas in the analysis, existing protected areas. Imagine you had a hypothetical species that um, who's, you know, it had a really, all of its high quality, or the vast majority of its high quality habitat, say, was already protected in a national park. Um, then the software wouldn't bother assigning priority to any remaining habitat for that species because it's all already protected. So it, it, instead, the, the software will prioritize species that don't have its, its high quality habitat protected. So, so, you, so that, you know, whether you include existing protected areas or not is going to tweak your definition of, of what's high priority or not. And because, you know, one of the goals of this is to um, identify additional new protected areas that we can develop, uh, I think it, it's important to include those protected areas. So most of the results I'll show you include the protected areas in the in the analysis. Next, species grouping. So um, I could either run one analysis with all of the birds grouped together into one analysis, and then you just define so that would be defining priority from a truly all bird perspective, or we could define priority separately for each bird group. So you could have a, a priority areas analysis for waterfowl, marsh birds, and land birds separately. In terms of species weighting, this is where those conservation priority uh, comes in that I was talking about earlier. So you could run a scenario where um, all species are treated equally, or you could uh, weight species with a higher conservation concern. So for example, you could assign a weight of four to species at risk, three to, to high priority species, two to moderate, and one to low priority. And that'll tweak your definition of what, what uh, priority areas are across the landscape. For geographic stratification, we could either run an, an analysis for the entire region, like one analysis, or we could stratify by province and run analysis separately for Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba. And that really has quite a big effect on, on the resulting priority areas. And the last factor there is grassland conversion risk. Um, 
So we could either include a model of conversion risk, which, or we could exclude it in the analysis. And I won't go into details about this now because I'm going to shift gears in a bit and focus more on that. So just, I'm just going to sidebar the conversion risk for a second. So the re as I said at the beginning, like we were really interested in producing a product that was uh, beneficial for a diversity of people within government and NGOs and, and all over the place. So that's why we, we found these definitions and what we did are these different factors. And so what we did is we ran dozens of different scenarios and, and each scenario um, looks at a different combination of these factors. And we sort of tweaked each factor one at a time to see how it influences priority. And by doing that, we were hope, hoping that we could produce a priority area scenario that would be beneficial for everybody. You know, within these dozens of scenarios we ran, hopefully there's a model that would, you know, help answer a specific question that one group might have. So, for example, if I go back to my first question, you know, do priority areas overlap across different bird groups? We might want to look at a scenario like this, where we, we treated each bird group separately, um, but we held all the other factors sort of at their null value. And that's what I'll show you results for now, because that was the main question we were asking at the beginning. So this map here shows the uh, results for waterfowl priority areas. Um, at the southern edge there is, is the U.S. border, of course, and the two black lines represent the provincial borders between Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba. Red is high priority, blue is low priority. And I also just want to point out um, the grayed out areas here. Those represent existing protected areas. So this is like Suffield National Wildlife Area and Military Training Area. Um, got, uh, the two east and west blocks of Grasslands National Parks down here. And for you folks in Manitoba, you might notice that uh, Riding Mountain National Park is conspicuously absent. I, so we somehow missed it in the analysis. I'm, I'm redoing that right now to include that um, in the analysis. So I don't think it'll affect the results too much. Um, so yeah, this is the results for waterfowl priority areas. And if I overlay those uh, previously defined target landscapes from the PHJV, you can see that they match quite nicely. And, and that's because they use the same duck models that we used for the analysis. So that's good to see. If you look at marsh birds, um, they, have a very, they have a similar pattern. You know, you can see that the wetter areas to the north um, and to the east there, kind of surrounding those remaining grasslands, are higher priority for marsh birds. And that's just where there's more, uh, more abundant wetlands and more permanent wetlands. So fairly similar to the, the waterfowl priority areas, but, but different also. Now, it's, you can also notice that those remaining grasslands in sort of southeastern uh, Alberta and southwestern Saskatchewan are very low priority for marsh birds. However, if you look at land birds, it's almost the exact opposite. You can see that those remaining grassland habitats are, are the highest priority for, um, for land bird species. So there is a big difference, I think. Now, if you look at, now if we want to look at overlap, this, this, what these figures are showing is I have marsh birds on the left, the priority areas for marsh birds on the left, priority areas for land birds on the right, and then I've overlaid those PHDB target landscapes over top. And you can see that for marsh birds in particular, there's some really uh, big areas of overlap. You know, so I think uh, there's definitely potential for, uh, for marsh birds to be benefit from um, conservation activities that are occurring in those waterfowl target landscapes. And that's intuitive, right? They both, they both uh, live in marsh, marshy habitats. Um, but even for land birds, there are still some overlap, right? There's, there's some, a few target landscapes that do occur in what appears to be really high priority habitat for land birds. And I think the, this, this one to the, the, this target landscape to the south, I think these are being driven by uh, northern pintail, which, which uh, tend to be associated with more dr uh, drier habitats than the rest of the waterfowl species. So there is some potential, I think, here for uh, land birds to benefit from waterfowl conservation activities in specific target landscapes. Further north up here, it looks like you know the land birds aren't going to benefit much. And so I think, you know, even though there is some some potential for um, Benefit to land birds. I think they're, you know, they really need land birds. Really need their own targeted conservation programs if we want to try and reverse or, or um, slow the declines that we've observed in those, those that bird group. So as I said, I just want to switch gears here for a few minutes and talk now about uh, grassland conversion risk, and then go on to show you how um, including conversion risk influences how we define priority areas from my my bird perspective. So, you know, I mentioned at the beginning of the talk that uh, we've already lost 75% of the grasslands in the prairie potholes. But if you, and if you zoom up on, you know, the periphery between remaining grasslands and cropland, anywhere you can choose any, any place really, you, you see this sort of patchwork mosaic of grassland and cropland. 
And that's because, you know, every year we're losing quarter sections. Quarter sections and sections are being tilled up for, for row crop agriculture and kind of slowly chipping it away at these remaining grasslands. And, if, you know, if we could have an understanding of which of these remaining grasslands are at higher risk of being converted, that would really give us a, a powerful decision support tool that would further streamline our ability to, to efficiently allocate resources. So we've already defined which habitats are the highest priority from a, a migratory bird perspective, but if we could also see which of those high priority habitats are at highest risk of conversion, you know, maybe that's where we want to be investing all of our conservation dollars, for example. And that's really what motivated uh, this, this uh, model, this paper that I'm showing here that was uh, spearheaded by Sarah Olin with the World Wildlife Fund. Uh, she used to be in Montana, now she's in South Dakota, I believe. Um, where we aim to build a probabilistic model that predicted the probability of grassland being converted to cropland. And I just the map on the right here just shows that it, this analysis wasn't restricted to just the Canadian prairie potholes, it was for the entire northern Great Plains. Uh, but today I'm just going to focus on the results from the Canadian prairie potholes. So how we built this model, I, again, I don't want to get into too much statistical details here, but essentially what we did is is we looked at a suite of variables associated with climate, topography, and soil, and we compared values of those variables in areas that had already been converted to cropland and uh, to areas that had, hadn't yet been converted. And what we found in Canada, anyways, uh, was that temperature, vapor pressure, precipitation, terrain ruggedness, slope, and then soil water retention and drainage um, were the best predictors of areas that had been con already been converted to cropland to cropland, sorry. And I think the reason for that is these variables also dictate um, how suitable an area is for cropland production. So if you look at, um, I think one of the reasons why we've already lost the majority of our grasslands in the tall grass prairie in Manitoba and eastern Saskatchewan and also up in the Aspen Parkland is because that's really productive cropland habitat. Like it, it has the, the ideal suite of climate, topography, and soil conditions that, that promote really uh, productive crop production. But then as you move further west and south into these remaining grassland areas, it gets hotter and drier, and it, be it becomes less suitable for crop production and actually more suitable for maybe ranching, cattle ranching, which obviously doesn't require um, the grassland to be tilled up and destroyed like it does in cropland. Um, so, I, so essentially what we're modeling here is we're modeling crop cropland suitability. Um, and then what we can do is we can apply that model to the remaining grassland pixels and determine which of those grasslands are most suitable for crop production and in turn likely at highest risk of conversion. So, um, and now I'll show you the results for, for what the model looks like. So this is, anything in white here is already converted to cropland and then the color shows the risk of remaining grassland. So you can see that those uh, large chunks of intact grassland um, have the lowest risk of conversion, and, and that's because they're the, the least suitable for crop production um, based on what we've already seen that's been converted. And then those, those remaining peripheral pixels and these sort of remaining tiny little patches of grassland that are up in the Aspen Parkland and in the tall grass prairie, uh, those are at the highest risk of conversion. Those are the ones that are the most suitable for crop production uh, in terms of climate, topography, and soil. So then what we did then is you can actually include this layer that we're show, I'm showing you here in the zonation analysis to, to tweak your definition of priority. You can see, you, so we've already defined priority based on uh, migratory birds, now we can see how conversion risk influences that. So what I'm going to do now is show you uh, uh, the results of this scenario here where we kind of treated everything, at their, all the different factors at their null value, we looked at all bird groups lumped together, and then we actually included conversion risk. So, so areas that are at a higher risk of conversion are going to get a higher priority for conservation. So what this map here is showing you, there's this, the, the map on the left is, is looking at the birds only model, so grassland conversion risk was not included, and the one on the right it was included. And depending on your screen resolution and stuff, it's, it's pretty difficult to, to notice the subtle differences here, but what I'll do then is show you the difference between these two maps. And so what this is showing, anything in blue gets a higher was assigned a higher priority when conversion risk was included. Anything in red uh, was a, a lower risk. Um, and so really what this shows you is that, again, the, the risk of those large intact, um, or the priority, sorry, of those large intact grasslands is lower and, and it assigns a higher priority to those tiny little pixels further north and, 
and outside of the, the core grassland areas um, because they're at higher risk of conversion. Um, so just to summarize you know, the main take home message of the talk then, um, it seems like there is some overlap across bird groups, uh, particularly waterfowl and marsh birds. I think marsh birds definitely have the potential to benefit from waterfowl conservation activities. However, land birds, uh, you know, we really probably need separate targeted programs that are looking to acquire or conserve um, a high priority land bird habitat um, in order to really meet our, our population objectives. And then the other take home message is that by including grassland conversion risk in in our priority areas analysis, it, it, it increases the priority of conserving these small isolated patches of grassland that are at higher risk of conversion. So next steps, I mentioned this is just the first phase of the project. Um, and uh, so we have some next steps. The first next step is to do what I'm doing right now, circulate the Allbird Priority Areas products to different users. As I mentioned, we really wanted to produce something that was valuable for a, a diversity of people. Um, and uh, that's what I'm doing right now. And this is, I think, the third or fourth time I've presented this talk. Um, and so I'm really trying to just get the word out there that we have these products available. So anyone who's interested in, in any of the, rap, the GIS layers that I've, that, you know, or the actual report, there's a report that, that summarizes these results as well, then please contact me through email and I'll make sure to get those to you, either the priority areas stuff or the conversion risk or both. Um, we really want to try and make sure this gets out into the hands of people that can make use of these products. Uh, we're also, um, I'm also working with the PHJB Science Committee to ensure these results are incorporated into the next implementation plan, which is scheduled to be complete by the end of uh, 2020. So we're actually meeting, uh, the Science Committee is meeting in Regina in December to, to, to discuss a strategy going forward for that. So I'm really excited to, that the results will be included in the implementation plan. And now I'm also trying to uh, improve and stream, or, uh, expand the analysis as well. So right now I'm, I'm um, expanding or uh, updating my land bird abundance models. I'm trying to, I currently, in the, the presentation I just showed you, I had models for 12 species of land bird. I'm trying to build models for 48 species right now because um, I have new data. And I'm also hoping to include a, a larger suite of climate variables in my abundance models. And the reason I want to do that is the next thing I want to look at is how climate change might affect uh, these priority areas. So it's it, all the climate change predictions are showing that the prairies are going to be hotter uh, with more frequent and intense storms. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think that has a, a potential to really alter what's good habitat for land birds. Um, and so what I'd like to do is to use those climate projections to... I, I do, yeah. You do? Yeah, oh, until 12. No. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, so I'd really like to look at uh, how climate change influences priority areas. And what I'd like to do is identify climate refugia, so areas that are a high priority for migratory birds now, but will still be a high priority, you know, 50 or 100 years into the future. So that concludes the talk, and I guess we have lots of time for questions uh, or comments from people, either now or later through email. Oh, hi, can, it's um, Laura Ellis from Alice Canada. Hi there. And um, I had, ha, have you identified um, high priority areas for restoration, or can you sort of um, just assume that from the from the mapping that you've done? Well, or, the particularly around grass stands. Around sorry, what? Around, around grass stands. We work with farmers and ranchers, and we do um, we do do some prairie restoration work. So you mean restoration work in terms of trying to um, restore er areas that have been converted to crop back to permanent grassland cover? Yeah. Yeah, the, the problem there is, and I, are you referring to, you know, like, yeah, the problem, I, the problem there is that uh, it's really hard for us to distinguish between native and tame grasslands in this. So in all of our modeling work, we I've lumped native and tame grass into one category. Um, but I'd have to think about that. Um, I think it, it, you could use that, I guess, if you looked at crop areas that were really close to high priority grasslands. Um, yeah, you could probably, you know, we, we might have to run a slightly different scenario to answer that particular question, but I think it would definitely be possible. Um, yeah. So, okay. so, yeah. 
So if you want to follow up with me, you know, through email, we could try and think of a way to do that. And you know, there might already be a, a scenario that would work. Um, but the problem is, you know, because these models are all based on a habitat type is one of the variables in the model. Anything that's existing cropland gets sort of shown as poor quality habitat for grassland birds, anyways. Um, but you can certainly try and I think you could try and uh, aim for a crop that is close to or adjacent to high priority grasslands um, for targeting. Okay. So there, yeah. Um, okay. So maybe we can follow up. Also, um, there's the grasslands market symposium next week in Calgary. I don't okay. know if you're um, familiar with that, but it's trying to oh. uh, increase the amount of resources available for both conservation and restoration. So, um, okay. yeah, that's um, Calgary, the 19th and 20th. Okay. And what's the name of the event? Um, it was, um, yeah. Um, why don't I'll, I'll look it up and then I'll and then I'll get back on after other people have their chance to to talk. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. More questions, comments? Well, if there's nothing else, I guess, uh, you know, feel free to speak up now or if, if, like I said, if you have questions about any of the details or, or if you want access to some of these products, um, please feel free to contact me. I'll put my email address up again. Uh, Sperry.Robinson at Canada.ca. It's very simple. Uh, but yeah, feel free to, to send me an email if you want um, further information or, or if you have a specific scenario that maybe I didn't run, we could, we could work on trying to run that for you. And Barry, this okay, is um, John Patterson Williams here. Just wanted to thank oh, you so much okay. for your time this morning. Yeah. Sorry? I'm sorry, there's a couple of people talking at once there. So yeah, I just wanted to say this is John Patterson Williams here. Thank you so much for your presentation this morning. We all really appreciated it. So thanks for your time. Oh yeah, thank you so much for inviting me. Anything else from the group? Yeah, it's Lara again. So so John John um, is also involved in the Gracia Symposium, but it's um, it was uh, I guess the main the main organizer was Ecosystem Services and Biodiversity Network. Okay. Um, in Alberta, yeah. Okay. If you cool. want, I can just I can just pass you over the uh, the agenda. Yeah, that'd be great. All right. If there's nothing else, uh, thank you everyone for attending today's uh, webinar. And Barry, thank you for your time today. It was a very interesting presentation. And we look forward to seeing you all uh, next month for our next uh, webinar. Thanks and have a great day. Thanks.